Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Mill Skills, a series of quick videos on learning to use your vertical mill. This is part 7, part 2, subsection J, adding features to your part. Let's go! Okay, a quick recap of where we are. This is the little part that we're making out of aluminum. It's 2 inches long, 1 inch wide, and half an inch thick. We've made that little step feature at the front, and now we're going to make those holes. And, uh, you know, we learned some basic techniques for positioning parts in the previous video to get that step feature in there, and now we're going to talk about these holes, which are a locational feature and have some different considerations and techniques that we can use. And here's the drawing that we're working from for this part once again, and I'm going to strongly recommend that you go watch part one of this two-part series on positioning features on your part, because we're, we're picking up where we left off, and a lot of what I say in this video is really going to make no sense if you haven't seen part one. All right, looking good. So I got the Jacobs chuck in here now and a center drill because we're going to set up to make the two holes that are shown in the drawing. And they are on the center line of the part on the long axis, 750 from our origin this way. And then the two holes are 750 apart. So I've gone back to zero on my DRO. And so you can see that the center of our center drill, the spindle center axis, is once again on our origin and, well, where the origin used to be before we milled it away, but uh, in the X and Y axes, it's still right there. But what's interesting about these holes is that they are specified as being on the center axis of the part. So this is where it's important to be thinking about your error. In fact, you always want to be thinking about your error. The reason, again, that we establish an origin and measure all of our features from that origin is because the dimensions of the block that we start with are never going to be perfect. There's always going to be, you know, a few tenths uh, at least, or, you know, here in the hobby shop, probably a thou of variation in the length and width and so on from what it's supposed to be. So if we measure inward from different edges when we're positioning features, what we're doing is we're pushing the error into bad places. You can never get rid of error, you can only push it around. So what you want to do is always be pushing the error into the same directions. You want to push all the error into the far corner of the part. And that way the relative positions of the features are all correct. And if you had any error in the dimensions of your part, it's all been pushed over here where hopefully it won't matter. Now when you've got a feature that's supposed to be on the center line of a part though, you got to think about how that part is going to be used because it might be more important that these holes are on the true center line of the part regardless of how close our width is to the final dimension or it might be more important that those holes are the exact right distance from either this edge or this edge. So it's, uh, it's really helpful to know how the part is going to be used. If you don't know, you're just working from the drawings, you don't know what this part is or how it's going to be used, then, well, uh, you're just going to have to do your best to get the holes the right position in all dimensions within the tolerances specified on the print. But here in the hobby shop, it's your part. You designed it, you know what you're making, you know how it's going to be used, so think about where you want that error to get pushed and where it'll do the least harm. So if it makes more sense to make sure that the holes are exactly on the center line, then we can uh, do a, a little trick here with the DRO that I'm going to show you in a moment. But let's put the first hole on the position specified in the drawing relative to the origin. And I'm going to do this one with the hand wheels because I haven't given those much love here. and I've been doing everything with the DRO like a lazy young person. So once again, to do this with the hand wheels, we need to make sure that when we did our edge finding on these two edges that we were approaching from the left and the front of the origin and then we found our edges and then didn't move anything, zeroed out the hand wheels and then don't ever move that way. Now when we're going to move to position our hole we can count inward this way and inward that way confident that we have no backlash that's going to mess up our distance measuring. All right, here we go. We need to go in 250 thou from our origin on the y-axis to get to the center line of our part. And these hand wheels are 100 thou around, which is pretty typical for an imperial machine. So that's 100. 200. 10, 20. 30, 40, 50. That is 250 thou. And by that I mean we have to go 500 thou to get to the center line of our part. So there's 300 thou. 400. And... 500. 
Now let's just go do a little sanity check up on our part. So we can bring our center drill down now. You can see that visually it certainly appears that we are on the center line of our part, so that's a little sanity check. Now this is where I talked about in the episode about layout, how layout can be a nice sanity check for other methods of measuring on the mill, and this is where that would come in handy. If we had a center line scribed on this part, then we could have even more confidence that we had done our hand wheel manipulation correctly. But I'm intentionally not using any layout here. We're flying the machine on instruments, as it were, just to show you that you can trust the measuring abilities of the machine once you understand how to use them. Just to further make that point, here's the DRO after that move, and you can see that we got within 6 tenths of 500 thou, just with good old-fashioned hand wheels. So if you're careful and you're paying attention, your hand wheels can be extremely precise. So once again, that's how they did it for like 100 years. Now for our x-axis move, I could do the same thing with my hand wheels, which are again carefully zeroed, and I could count and yada yada yada. But I want to show you one other way. For small parts like this, uh, or when traveling shorter distances, you can always just throw an indicator on the table. The indicator is the old school DRO, and you can always just set this guy up. And again, because you're measuring table travel directly, you don't have to worry about backlash. So this is a one inch travel indicator and we only need to move 750 thou. So I just compress this guy up, zero it out, and away we go. Seven hundred and fifty thousandths. And once again, we got within six tenths of our measurement. Now. That 41, that ain't no accident. Generally, these uh, DROs, these Chinese DROs, the, the optical scales in them are actually set up for metric, and so they do the conversion to Imperial in software. So the uh, increments that the optical scale is measuring are something that's a nice round number for you know microns or some similar metric measurement. And so uh, the error always comes out to kind of the same amounts here. So this is probably off by you know a couple of tenths or some number of microns. And that's not to say that this is less accurate because it's being converted to Imperial in software. It's just to say that however number of microns I'm off, it's the same in both dimensions and that happens to convert to 39 hundredths. But that's why you'll often see these same amounts of error. And you know, when using this guy in Imperial, I wouldn't necessarily trust this last digit. Uh, it's, there is gonna be some error introduced by rounding to a different measurement system. Okay, let's spot our hole. Ah, but now we have one more interesting choice to make. Because we're not sloppy woodworkers here, making this hole is at least a three-step process. We're gonna spot it, drill it under size, and ream it to final dimension. However, that means changing our tool out over and over, and because the universe is a cruel place, these tools are all different lengths, which means we probably have to move our knee or our column between every setup. So machining is always a balance between setup time and machining time, and setup is by far the most time-consuming portion of making a feature. So generally speaking, you wanna optimize your setup time. So because we're making two identical holes, we can minimize our setup time by spotting each of them, then drilling each of them, and then reaming each of them, and just moving back and forth between each step. And because we know how to use our DRO, or we've got an indicator on the table, or we understand how to manage our backlash, we can keep moving back and forth, and each time we know we're gonna get back very, very close to where we were for the next operation. However, there may be some error introduced by that moving back and forth. So generally not with the DRO, but with hand wheels or other methods, you know, you can sometimes introduce error. So if precision, ultimate precision is important, if we really wanna maintain perfect concentricity with all three of these steps, the only way to guarantee that is to not move the table between steps. So if precision is really, really critical, we might bite the bullet and do all three operations on this hole, move over, do all three operations on the next hole, and then quietly curse out Metallicor, the god of machining, as we're cranking our knee and our column up and down over and over again. And just to add insult to injury, 
on small hobby machines like this, there often it isn't enough z-axis space for these long chucking reamers and your Jacobs chuck. So you got to remove the Jacobs chuck and put the reamer in a collet to have enough space to get the operation done. And if you're wondering why we spot drill and ream a hole in the machine shop instead of just drilling it like a peasant, well, I explained all that in my lathe skills series, which is why I told you to watch that first, because all of the skills there apply very much here as well, and I know some of you didn't do it, so go do that right now. I'll wait. Okay, let's ream this hole. And remember I said at least three operations per hole. We might also chamfer this and counterbore it. Okay, I'm gonna position the second hole now. So I'm gonna move on the x-axis using any of the methods that we previously discussed. Okay, there we are at 1.5 inches from our origin. Now for the y-axis, of course, we're already set up because we just made that hole, but I wanna show you a different trick. So I talked about the trade-off between uh, having it be exactly on the center line versus having it be exactly a fixed distance from our origin. So let's make this one the other way. Let's say that uh, we wanna prioritize it being on the center line. So here's a little trick that uh, the DRO can do for us. So we just found that edge. Now we come up here and zero the y-axis. And then we're gonna come up and find the other edge. Bring that guy down. Here we go again. So now we have this number on the DRO. What is this number? It's the width of our material because we found both edges plus the diameter of our edge finder because we found the edge plus a radius on both sides. So this is a 200 thou edge finder and it's a one inch wide part. So we should be at 1200. So you can see that we're 3 thou and some change short here. And that error is coming from a couple of sources. One, I know for a fact that I didn't exactly nail the dimension on the width of my part. And it was a little bit sloppy with my edge finding, so I probably added a thou here or there. But what's cool about this technique is that none of that error matters very much because we have this magical half function here. So I just pick an axis, y, and I tell it I want half of that. And there is half of that number. Now, what's magical about that is that I can now move my y axis to zero. Don't forget to move the edge finder out of the way first so you don't snag it. Bring this guy back to zero. And now what we've done is we found a position on the y axis exactly between those two edge finding operations that we did. And what's clever about that is that it cancels out a lot of that three and change thousandths of error that we had, because any error that came from our edge finding technique, assuming you're fairly consistent in how you edge find, you're gonna make about the same amount of error each time, and that error is gonna get canceled out on both sides. And we've also canceled out the width of the edge finder automatically on both sides and any error that was in the width of our part, the dimensions of the original stock don't matter because we've found the center line of whatever we have. And here we are back with our center drill and you can see that at least by eye, we're clearly on the center line of our part. But more importantly, we know that this hole is going to be more precisely equidistant from these two faces than this hole was. This hole, we can be confident, is exactly 500 thou from this face and 750 from this face but this hole we know is exactly centered on whatever dimension we happen to hit here when we were squaring up this stock. So again, whichever method of positioning the features depends on which dimensions are most critical and where you feel like pushing the error to get it out of the way. Whoa, easy there with the zero buttons, cowboy. You don't wanna cost yourself that hard-earned origin that we spent much of last video figuring out how to get. So before you do something like this center line trick, you wanna get yourself out of your absolute mode into, for example, incremental mode. 
So every DRO is going to have an incremental and an absolute mode. And incremental is useful for many, many things. But one of the cool tricks you can do with it is it gives you a second temporary coordinate system. So over here, I can happily zero things out, do my center line trick and whatever, and then come back to absolute mode and I haven't lost my hard earned origin. If you lose this, well, now you got to redo your touching off and your edge finding and all that stuff. And it's a bunch more setup time, and you're probably going to end up with a very slightly different origin than you had before, so you're going to be introducing error to subsequent features and so on. Now, most DROs also have, in addition to absolute and incremental mode, uh, the ability to set datum points. So in this case, you might have 10 or even 100 uh, other origins that you can set uh, by using this guy here. And the you know details on how to do this vary by every DRO, so you're really going to want to get to know your manual if you need to track multiple points on your part like that. The English translations in those manuals are creative, but it's worth spending some time figuring it out because setting datum points and switching between incremental and absolute will let you do a great deal of cool tricks on the DRO. Real talk now, Blondie Hacks fans. In the distant future, when the great cat wars come, the boy cats are going to go off to fight. The girl cats are going to take up the welders and the machine tools and the laser tank factories. And together, we will defeat whatever the new bad guys are called. This is Sprocket the Riveter, available in women's and men's. Lots of cool colors, every size imaginable. Blondiehacks.com slash store. All right, let's give this a little deeper. And here's our final part. I hope uh, this exercise gave you a feel for the different methods you can use for positioning features on your part and uh, the strategies you can use to hit dimensions and minimize error. Don't forget to check out the cool new stuff in the Blondie Hacks store, blondiehacks.com slash store. Check out my Patreon if you like this content and you want to see more of it. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.